Okay, what I'd like to do now is talk about the sun. It's my second attempt. I don't know what happened to the first one. But anyway, the sun is the all-powerful uh, member of our solar system, which powers light, heat, um, as well as uh, uh, molecular motion, uh, which keeps life possible, liquid water on this planet, as well as uh, basking other planets in sun. Um, the sun actually has 99 point nine nine percent of the mass of our entire solar system give you some idea there's the earth in size tell my kids that we can get about 108 of those earths across this way 108 across this way 108 across from this side to the other side um, you could actually hollow out the sun and put a tremendous amount of those things in there have a little bit of fun with the sun um, you can see uh, you can grab onto it. Um, I like this one better. Um, be the coloration is amazing. Um, but I like that one the best. But you can find lots of other images of people having fun with the seeming size of the sun. Um, the sun is a very special thing in our solar system. We actually even give it a symbol as a circle and a dot. Um, this, the things you see here, this is I think in a hydrogen filter and you can actually see where the sun's um, opening and I can't tell if these are flares um, or these are coronal mass ejections or these are probably sunspots or location of sunspots but it's looking at the sun in a non-visible cue so it looks a little bit different than it does with our eyes even though you should never look at the sun with your eyes. Comparing the sun to other stars um, we actually have the Sun located right here. You can actually compare it to Aldebaran, um, the big star in Taurus, or Betelgeuse, the alpha star of Orion, which is this big red star. And you can see, even with stars that are close, nothing special. Um, Sirius, that's the second brightest star in our sky, if you look at it in terms of what's called uh, parent magnitude. But even if you take Betelgeuse and throw it against the largest star that we're aware, which is called VY Canis Majoris. Um, the sun would be located in that box and it would be that big. Um, if you actually think about a jet airplane, and a jet airplane on this planet um, would actually move across this sun, um, moving around the sun, and it can make it in 11,000 Earth years. So this is a very massive star. Um, so when you think about our sun, don't, it is special in our solar system, not special in, in terms of other stars. Um, looking at this diagram right here, um, we tend to think the Sun is the center. Um, remember we used to have a, a geocentric, we used to think of the Earth as the center, a geocentric. We now know it's the Sun, a heliocentric, Sun-centered, um, not a universe, but a Sun-centered section of our sky. These are some of the stars that are close to us. Um, the closest star, Alpha Centauri, which is right there located at 4.3 light years away. Um, this disk, this circle is uh, 5 and 10 and 15 light years distant. So you can see some of the stars are located out there kind of far. And what they did here is they actually just took a line and they drew it out to a point like right here, saying that that star is located right there at that distance, 8.3. 583 for Sirius, the second brightest star in our sky, but it really is located at a certain angle below, and the Sun, the Sirius, the star is actually located right there, even though we like to think of it as being a certain distance. So that's what this one does, and you can see none of the stars that uh, we normally consider in constellations as being as big and bright. Um, the stars that tend to be closest to our Sun tend to be smaller stars than normal. So they would actually be, you know, although Sirius, um, Sirius, that star, um, which is located right there, um, located close to um, the angle of the sun, is a large star, um, but not large compared to large stars. Second thing I'm going to have them do, and the next thing I'm going to have them do is we're going to talk about the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. A German astronomer and an American astronomer. Um, actually came to the point at the same time that all stars share two things. They all share, let me get a different color, they all share brightness
but not only brightness, true brightness, which is called luminosity, and they all share color. Um, red all the way to blue, red, orange, yellow, and then we actually move into like the greens, and then we turn into the whites, and then finally into the blues. So if we actually started plotting these stars based on these two things, um, we'd have to set up a graph, and the graph can be set up lots of different ways. Normally we talk about absolute magnitude, we talk about the bright stars as being up here, which means we talk about the dim stars being down here. Temperature, we talk, um, you can do it a couple of different ways, um, but we talk about the hot stars being here. You could really put the hot stars over on this side if you wanted to too. So that means we put the cool stars over on this side. These are going to be in Ks. Um, temperature wise these are um, probably down to about 3000 K all the way up to maybe 50,000 K and then sitting right around here it's 6 thousand K and um, luminosity this is one times actually let's put one up here one times um, luminosity which is means our Sun being that yellow orange thing that it is would be located right there what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the kids draw a dot to represent the Sun and I'm going to have them draw some lines on there just so they can keep track of which one is us. Um, we're located right around 6,000 K and luminosity of 1. This is luminosity of 0.1. This is luminosity of 0 0.1. This would be luminosity of 10, 100. Let me get rid of that because that didn't work out well. This is 100. This would be 1,000, and these stars up here would be 10,000 times brighter, um, which means if you put them at the same distance, 10,000 times brighter. Absolute magnitude, I'm not going to put the numbers up there, um, but basically um, it, it talks about uh, the smaller the number, negative numbers, um, are the brighter stars. Then we go back, and let me just pick, make sure I have black. Um, I have them start putting dots in here and we start putting more dots and I actually start having them hit them faster and I know with this it actually starts drawing um, dashes rather than dots but I want dots And we start drawing more and 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 more. And they actually put thousands of stars on a diagram like this. But sooner or later they started figuring out that there's a pattern. If you take a look, it's not a haphazard, although there is some haphazardness in it. It looks like most of the stars are located right in this area. And these stars actually have a name which is called Main Sequence. And all this means is most of the stars are located in this line looking thing. And then we have a couple other, we have two other groups. We've got the group that's located like right in here. And we have the group that's located like right in here. Um, these stars, stars tend to be really cool, but you notice they're also bright. And how do you make these reddish stars bright? Well, you make them large even up to super I have no idea what I'm writing there super giants and these down here tend to be incredibly warm stars they're not quite as warm as blue but they're white um, which normally you think of as being hot and should be bright. How do you make a hot star small? Well, you make them 
How do you make a Bright Stars gem? You make them small. These are the white dwarfs. Now we do have some intergroup stars. These are stars, and what we actually think is that these main sequence stars tend to go off in this direction when they expand and cool, and then these stars move back forth into this direction. So that star right there could be moving one way or the other. And then these stars are dead, and all they do is cool off so that they migrate back and back. And eventually they become too dim to see, or they become black dwarf. And we see lots of black dwarfs. They're still giving, they're not enough light to really give visible light, not enough heat to give visible light, but we can look at them with infrared scopes. Uh, we can see that there are lots of them out there. So this is the HR diagram. Or the Hertzberg Russell diagram. A couple other examples down here. Um, you can see the main sequence. You can see super giants, red giants, white dwarfs. Um, they talk about solar radii being a certain size. Um, they talk about, uh, oh, I didn't do those. Um, there's a spectral class where we actually start talking about uh, this funky little saying um, where we talk about O stars, O, B, A, F, G, M, and we actually are a G2, or a G2 V star, which you can see again right there. Um, sun's located right there, uh, right at one, and real close to the G. Um, but so we're located right there. Um, then we actually have all the rest of the groupings. So we got uh, the way you can remember this is just think of oh, be a fine girl, or I guess if you are a girl, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. O B A F G K M. Let me pause this. Okay, so here's another H HR diagram, same things, um, but now it's actually showing you blue giants. Um, you can see they've actually got some warmer temperatures too. Um, increasing temperature goes this way, decreasing temperature goes this way, increasing luminosity, decreasing luminosity, luminosity is going up, 10 to the 6th, luminosity is going down to minus 4. Um, but you can see um, basically the same kind of things. If I actually go to this, and this is uh, initiate throw on 100 stars. This is something I'm going to show my kids in class and they're going to actually do a project on this one and they're going to watch stars and you can click on the individual stars, find their mass, their luminosity, their temperature and how long they think they're going to live and I want them to actually see that the stars as you go to cooler temperatures, um, even through the greens 354 million years, down to oranges 2,390 million years, going down to reds, um, going down to reds where we have 32,000 million years, um, all the way down to this star right there, uh, goes for uh, 246,000 million years. Okay, so we go back to here. Going down here, nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is actually caused when we have Okay. When we actually have hydrogen, which is normally fighting each other, um, then hydrogen actually will, um, if you get it to 10 million degrees, 10 times 10 to the 6th million K, um, what will happen is these hydrogens will actually move um, move so fast that they'll um, no longer fight each other. Um, they'll actually collide, um, given, making a deuterium, which is made out of one proton and one uh, neutron. I think the protons they're showing is red and neutron. The deuterium, which would normally want to fight each other, will start moving. Again, at temperatures higher than 10 million degrees, they'll come together and they'll actually start slamming together um, with another hydrogen, and they'll make something called tritium. And tritium is actually a different uh, 
this should, probably should just be hydrogen, although they're saying it's helium because they're giving it two protons. One proton's hydrogen, two protons atomic number is helium. Um, and they're going to slam those together, they're going to take those two, slam them together, and finally make regular helium. Um, and every time you, it does this, it produces a bunch of energy. So I'll also show them this picture. Um, let's initiate. Um, we're going to increase the number of hydrogens so we can get a better chance of getting them to collide. There's the deuterium. Other, there's actually a uh, tritium. And then if I actually increase temperature, make these things go faster, I can finally get a hydrogen in here, some or helium in here somewhere. Looking for four. Let's put in some more fuel. Anybody see a four? There's a four. Okay, the purple ish color. There's another one. There's another one up there. Okay, so this is the way the sun actually gets it, and the sun would love to be able to give more hydrogen um, as time goes on, but of course it doesn't. It gets a finite supply. It'll keep changing hydrogen into helium until something happens, and it runs out. Okay, um, what I also want to show is once they actually make this heat, um, it's all created in the core. This is where the nuclear fusion takes place. Once it creates the heat and the temperature, um, it starts to move out, but what happens is it zigs and zags, and it moves back and forth. Um, because this is so dense, it sometimes will move all the way back in, and it can take over a million years for this light and heat to make it all the way through the sun, um, all the way through the radiative zone, which is what I'm in right now, and then as it gets um, higher and higher towards the surface. It gets less and less dense. It starts moving more and more towards the outside through the convective zone. Finally reaches the surface. The, f um, the uh, oh, I hate that when that happens. Core, the radiative, convective, the photosphere. And then once it reaches the photosphere, um, it goes zooming out in eight minutes and 20 seconds later, if it's going out in the right direction, it hits the earth. Okay, sitting on this outside of the sun, the photosphere right here, um, there, you, there's a whole bunch of just um, motion that you really can't see with your eyes. But if you zoom in, it's called granation. And I'll show you an animation of this one, but the darker color that you see right there, um, sort of like the Texas orange, um, that's where material's moving back in. And the lighter color, the whites and the lighter oranges, this is where material's rising. So it's rising and sinking and rising and sinking and rising and sinking. That's called granation. It looks very grainy. Uh, if you zoom into one of the sunspots, which are darker areas on the sun, remember that uh, the sun at the surface itself is 6,000. Okay, and I may not have done that on this one. 6,000 K. And that gives us our nice orange color. That's how we got to this area right there. And going back down to this section, well, what happens is that the sunspot is only 5,000 K. So it's not as hot, it's not as bright. When you put something that's not as bright in front of something that is, remember this is 6,000, um, it doesn't look as bright. If you could bring a cup full of this thing into the room, it'd be the brightest thing you'd ever seen. If you brought a cup full of this, it'd be a little bit brighter, but probably not a whole lot, and you wouldn't be able to tell it. Either way, um, you wouldn't be around very long because this would incinerate everything in a classroom. Okay, and then this down here, um, this is talking about sunspots, is actually having two areas. It has what's called the umbra, the darker part, it's taking sort of like an eclipse, penumbra, the lighter part. Um, the granule gives you the granation. Um, intergranule line, which is the darker area, the um, Texas orange color. Um, it also can have pores. Um, it actually, the sun, earth would be um, probably about this size on this surface of the sun, this photosphere. And then the last thing, uh, what I want my kids to be able to do is to actually talk about number one. It is the core. It's where nuclear fusion takes place. Number two, 
Um, it's called the radiative zone. This is where energy gets transformed through radiation um, out towards the surface. And it reaches number three, which is the convective zone, which um, rises because it's hot. And it sinks because it's cold and rewarm so it can do the whole thing all over again. And then finally this dark line, which is the number four, um, which is the photosphere, produces visible light. It's the section we can see with our eyes. It has the sunspots. It's number 6,000 K, sunspots 5,000 K. Um, it can open up and actually have uh, solar flares um, and other things. Um, then we have this actual atmosphere of the sun, number five, which is the chromosphere. Chromosphere, if you actually draw the sun and you draw things that look like this, um, you're drawing the uh, chromosphere, which is that section. Um, number six is the corona. This is the actual corona. And then corona can actually have holes in it, and this allows uh, solar wind to go streaming out into space. Another one right here. Um, and as this happens to be facing the Earth, um, it may actually give us much brighter auroras, uh, much more the aurora borealis being traveling much uh, lower uh, latitudes, maybe even into the United States, central United States. Um, but it can also cause lots of problems with satellites. Okay, um, let me show you one more website. Show this one to you really quickly. Um, nearest star is the sun. You can see sunspots, and they actually do move around in this direction. Uh, can I make this thing a little larger? Okay, and then composition of the sun. Um, by far, the fuel, hydrogen, uh, 75 or better. Um, does have 21 or 2 percent helium, which is the byproduct. Has a little bit of oxygen. Has a little bit of the rest of these things in there. Um, these numbers will fluctuate as the sun gets older. Um, produces different wavelengths. Um, produces more yellowish, orangish light than it does uh, bluer light or red light. Why it has its color. Um, lots of different. There's the corona talking about temperatures. Believe it or not, the corona and the chromosphere is hotter than the photosphere. Remember 6000 K. Here's some pictures talking about the granation and you can see the um, inner grain, inner granule lines. Um, you can see the lighter stuff coming up. You can sort of see it moving into the darker material. Same sort of thing right there. There's a sunspot. Um, talks about uh, sunspots are actually usually in pairs with magnetic lines um, which give you the prominence um, which I didn't talk about, um, which I'll have my kids learn, as well as spicules. So we actually have these magnetic lines going up there, um, all of which are much larger than the sun. And you can see they can be open prominent, so they can be closed prominent. And then this is looking at the sun x-ray wavelengths, and you can start seeing some things that you can't see there. And these are uh, coronal mass ejections, um, where the SOHO satellite actually puts a um, there's the size of the sun, puts a disk in front of the sun, and you can actually see the um, coronal mass ejections, um, coronal mass actually being thrown out into the solar system. Okay, that does it. Thank you much. Bye.